10,000 ideas, 50,000 people, $2.5 billion. Over the last 30 years, I've worked with 50,000 people to generate over 10,000 problem solutions, and those problems generated two and a half billion dollars in first year profits for their companies. My name is Len Bertain, and I'm a business consultant. And I teach client employees to both identify and solve problems. What I want to answer today is not what I do, because I'm crystal clear about that. I know what I've been doing for 30 years, and I'm crystal clear, and the clients know what I do. But what I want to talk about is why did I get the results that I got? A lot of my business friends over the years have told me that those are not only good results, they're spectacular. So I'd like to explore with you today some of my ideas about why those numbers occur. We start with believing that work is problem solving. It's almost a given. But for example, you come to work in the morning, there's a note on your desk. Your largest client tells you that the package they were expecting from you that you'd promised didn't arrive. Problem. <laughs> so you got to solve that problem. Or better yet, you're a software developer. Client that you just sold a new piece of software to calls up to say there's a huge bug and they can't use the software as advertised. A problem. You got to solve it. So if you have a small problem or a simple problem, you fix it. But if it's a little more complicated or difficult, you form a team of either people within your work directive or external to your work directive, and you solve it. So what I'd like to do today is look at the why from three angles. I would like to look at it from the perspective of an individual who went through my program from the perspective of a business that experienced the program and the clients who were the benefits, beneficiaries of the program. And I'd like to do it by telling a few stories, three stories that relate directly to those issues. The first one, I walked in to a client at six o'clock in the morning and a young man was presenting an idea that he had worked on over the weekend at my urging. I wanted him to give me the pro, his, his work, but instead he gave it to the general manager who never heard an idea that he didn't like. But not only that, this general manager was a nasty person and I'd been dealing with him for a couple of weeks and he took the idea from the young man, and he was making the second pot of coffee and had the coffee grounds in the other. And he threw the idea on the piece of papers into the garbage can and then threw the coffee grounds on top of it. At that point, I have a huge responsibility because that young man put trust in me to go home, implement the idea, and bring it in. And that's what happened. So I charged over to the general manager, grabbed him, and told him to pick the paper up out of the garbage, wipe off the coffee grounds, and give it to me. So I took the pieces of paper, went with the young man in to see the CEO, and it asked him whether he still believed in the no blame 
concept that we'd agreed on, change without reprisal. And I also told him about the, what happened to this young man, and he apologized profusely. So he told the young man, go ahead, implement your idea, because it's a great idea, and it'll make us some money, but follow Lynn's procedure, his process. So what the idea was was pretty simple, is he had figured out a way to take the changeover of a paint, let's say red, to green on the production line, and he figured out how to do it between, it used to take 20 to 40 minutes, now his idea would take it less than 90 seconds. So this was a great idea. Now what you realize, this was a process in the overall production line. In that time that he saved of 20 to 40 minutes translated directly into increased production less than 90 seconds. So it was a great idea. So what did I get out of that? Why does that relate to why? I believe that the free exploring mind of the human individual is the most important thing in the world, the most valuable thing in the world. And it was my responsibility to protect that, and I did. Okay, we've heard about the young man, the individual against the system. Let's talk about the company. Similar situation, a young man came to, up to me after one of my uh, sessions, and he said, I hate working here because I can't implement any ideas or changes and I said, well, we're doing that in the classes. But he said, no, for the last 15 years, I haven't been able to do anything. And I said, OK. And so he took me out to his work area, and it was a mess. This is a manufacturing company that should have known better, but they didn't. And I took the young man, and I said, OK, let me explain something to you. This is the 567 rule that we discovered as a way, as a sort of a, an alternative to the 8020. Anybody in here know about the 8020 or 2080 rule? Okay. The 2080 rule, which is the top point of that curve, is says 20% of your effort is going to give you 80% of your benefit, or 20% of the costs give you 80% of the benefit. But because we were always in a hurry to get things done, we zeroed in on the 567, which says 5% of the effort will get 67% of the benefit. Now the reason we, I pointed this out to the young man, is he wanted to be at the 100% solution. We got to do it right, Len, and I said, no, you don't. You've got to make progress. And the 100% solution sometimes leads to multi-million dollar projects that are nonsensical. So what I've trained everybody that's ever worked in any one of my uh, programs, that 567 is the way you proceed. Progress is important. So what I did is I gave the young man a goal of measuring how long it took to do a changeover, a setup on his machines with the current mess in the facility. And we made up a kludged up a cart and had the new tools that he needed on the cart, took the old ones off, put the new ones in, and it was a wonderful speedy process that took the setup from six to seven hours down to less than 30 minutes. And again, if you think about that in terms of revenue for a company, it, we translated almost all of that saved time into increased production. Now this was a great idea, but the young man was extremely demotivated by the company's lack of interest 
and allowing him to improve his environment. And so what I got out of that, and why this also relates to the why, it is almost a natural human condition to want to improve your environment. It's almost a given. And when a company keeps people from being able to do that, it's demotivating, and it was our obligation as facilitators to make sure that didn't happen. And we were successful at that. So we've talked about the individual, we've talked about the company, now let's talk about the customer. If you've ever looked at any of my stuff on the internet, you will have seen me telling this story. But I walked into a room after I'd been out on the factory floor working with some other teams, and this team was just sitting there. Now, I, part of my program, I give teams a goal of $100,000 of inefficiencies that they can find that they can fix for less than $2,000. So $100,000, $2,000 is 50 to 1. It's 50 to 1 ROI. And again, that's pretty good. And this team was just sitting there. And whenever I see that, I went up to them and I said, does anything piss you off about when you come to work? And the guy said, oh, hands go up. And so I said, okay, pick one idea and run with it. And so the informal leader said, well, we're going with my idea. And I said, well, what's your idea? And he said, hot jobs. I hate the concept of hot jobs. I said, well, what's a hot job? He said, well, when a customer calls up, he calls up in the front office, they get this hot job that has to get out right away, and I have to tear down my machine, run the hot job, then I have to put the other job I was working on back on, and that's a waste of time. And if you just do the math, you know, you've added do redundant setups, and that's a big waste of time. So right at that moment, the CEO walked in. He had been out on the shop floor, and he was all excited because he'd been talking to different teams that were on projects trying to improve his business and making him a lot of money. And so he was really excited. He walks over to this team, and he says, what's going on? What are you guys working on? And, they, and the guy says, hot jobs. And the CEO goes, no, 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 no. We fixed that problem about three or four months ago. And, the guy stands up and he slams his hand down on the table. He says, damn it, we didn't solve that problem. You solved it up in the front office, but you didn't solve it where I am. And the CEO goes, ooh. And I, I said, okay, calm down, guys. I gave them each a pad of ruled, like yellow pad ruled paper and said, you take one, the CEO, and two of the other guys on the team, Informal leader, you take another pad, the other two guys, go out to the shop floor and find red tags that are still sitting there and come back in. And you've got 15 minutes to do that. So they come in 15 minutes precisely. They've got the ruled pads filled with numbers from different jobs that are still sitting there. And the CEO goes, oh, <laughs> problem one not solved, was it? So now, what did we, we get here? Well, it turns out the problem that they were worried about, hot jobs, wasn't a problem, it was a symptom. And so a lot of times when we go into companies, people are working on symptoms and not the problem. So we got that cleared away and we worked on, an, uh, again, a setup problem, reduced it from hours to less than 20 minutes in this case. So what did we learn from this? We learned that if you get a team of people that are empowered to come up with an idea and they all agree and have the same perspective on the problem and they understand who they are serving, namely the customer, they will more than likely be vested in reaching a solution. And they will. So with that in mind, let me summarize what we came up with. We have the individual. 
The free exploring mind of the individual human is the most valuable thing in the world. And we protected that. Secondly, for the company, it is human nature to want to improve one's environment. That's a given. And when companies get in the way of doing that, that's terribly demotivating for the participants in the program. And we were able to avoid that. And finally, for the customer, if a group of people have a vested common interest and approach the problem from the same perspective, they will more than likely be able to solve the problem if they understand who they are serving, the customer. I have a, just a few things to say to those of you that are matriculating in the next months. When you come to your new job, you more than likely will see problems, lots of problems. And I caution you, do not try to solve any of these problems on your own. Find a cadre of friends that have an interest in helping you solve the problem. Find a manager or executive who will work with you to champion the idea to completion. So, find a team, recruit a champion, go after to solve the problem. Thank you. <laughs>